Okay, so this is pre-class 4, Muscles and Their Functions of Module 5, looking at the musculoskeletal system. And this is part 2 of pre-class 4. So in this part, we're going to be looking at the structure and function of the muscular system. Um, so the learning objectives for part 2 is that you, you should be able to use the anatomy of the limbs as an example, define the terms agonist, synergist, antagonist, and fixator. Using specific examples from human anatomy, describe the different actions brought about by the musculoskeletal system. So for example, flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, circumduction, rotation, pronation, supination in examples. Um, and we did, of course, discuss some of those in terms of the movements possible at joints. So now, of course, it's the muscles which bring about those movements of joints. So we're looking at which muscles bring about some of these actions. And then lastly, using examples, describe the structure and function of the different types of fascicle arrangement in muscles. So in general terms, we've got all these um, terms related to functions and movement of the different skeletal muscle systems. So here we've got the anterior surface largely showing of the uh, skeletal system. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, the muscular system here. Um, so the muscles of the head and the neck, uh, the chest and the arms and the lower leg, uh, sorry, the thigh and the uh, leg. So we've got the um, arm and the forearm. Um, and then the hand here. So um, the term synergist um, is the muscles which are active during most movement. So we know that, um, for example, our postural muscles are moving most of the time. In a movement, the um, muscle which brings about the largest proportion of an action is known as the prime mover or an agonist. So for example, um, in uh, flexion of the uh, elbow, uh, we get um, the biceps brachii muscle, which is this muscle here, is our prime mover. Um, so that's our prime mover in flexion of the elbow. An antagonist is a muscle that opposes the prime mover. So in this case, uh, prime mover is the biceps, and it's the muscle on the posterior surface, which is known as the triceps brachii, which is going to oppose that movement. And that uh, interaction between our agonist and our antagonist actually enables uh, regulated, coordinated movement so that we're not just flopping around the place whenever our muscles are contracting. It's actually quite a controlled movement most of the time. We have the other muscles which actually uh, oppose each other to prevent movements. Uh, these are called fixators. So these are, for example, if you want to lock your elbow in place uh, with your arm extended holding a book and you don't want your um, flexion and extension, you just want to hold it out there, then those are fixators and so they oppose each other to prevent movements. And lastly, um, we have muscles which can cause movement of the eyeballs, cartilage and skin, and, and they can act as valves, so sphincters, for example. So we have skeletal muscle around the mouth and the eyes, for example, um, orbicularis oculi and orbicularis uh, oris, for example. These are sphincter muscles. So this is the posterior surface. Um, so you can see the muscles at the back here. And these are the, some of the shoulder muscles, the deltoid, for example, the latissimus dorsi. We've got the gluteus maximus. Um, and then we've got our hamstrings here. And we've got the uh, gastrocnemius and sole, uh, so, soleus muscle, um, which then uh, continues on as the Achilles tendon. So here on the posterior surface of the upper limb, we've got our triceps muscles. And then we've got our um, uh, flexors here and extensors on the other side. So muscles have what we call origins and insertions. So they, for example, the biceps brachii originates from with two heads, because biceps means two heads. Um, and so we've got one head originating from um, uh, the acromion process, and we've got another head originating from um, the humerus here. And so those two heads of muscles eventually uh, insert by our tendon into uh, the radius here, and we've got a little radial tuberosity here. So this muscle in particular has two heads, so it's got two origins, and then one insertion point. So muscles can only bring about movements of joints in which they cross. So for example, because this actually connects to the scapula, 
uh, via the acromion process, then um, it actually crosses two joints. So it crosses the shoulder joint here, and then it crosses the elbow joint here. So it can actually form uh, functions across those two joints. So some muscles may have one origin or multiple origins. So biceps brachii, as we mentioned, has two heads, so it's got two origins. Something like triceps brachii has three heads, so it's got three different origins, but one uh, broad insertion point uh, into the, the ulna. So here, if we use the upper limb as an example, using some of these uh, terms which we just introduced, uh, for flexion at the elbow, the agonist or the prime mover is the biceps brachii, whereas its antagonist, which causes flexion, uh, uh, antagonist for flexion at the elbow being brought about by biceps, is the antagonist, that is the triceps brachii. You can see it inserting into the uh, ulna down here. So if we sort of reverse these movements, so instead of talking about flexion, and we were talking about extension at the elbow, so straightening the arm, not bending the arm, then the agonist becomes the triceps brachii and the antagonist becomes the biceps brachii. Now we have our synergist here, um, which is um, the brachioradialis muscle, and the brachioradialis muscle helps to uh, fix and control and coordinate those movements, particularly for flexion at the elbow. So the muscle or the actions brought about by a muscle when it contracts depends upon its size and its position. It depends upon the structures it attaches to. It depends exactly where and how it's attached to them. And it also depends upon the features of the joint it acts across. So if you've got bony structures in the way, then obviously it's going to limit how much um, movement's going to be possible. And we talked about that um, issue when we looked at joints. So for in general terms, flexion or flexors decrease the angle. So if we think about the um, elbow as an example, when you flex your elbow, you're decreasing that angle between your arm and your forearm, and so that angle decreases and that brings about flexion. So extension then is the opposite of that. So the extension, if that takes place in the body, generally you're increasing the angle or unfolding um, those limbs in particular. Adduction means to bring towards, so if you've got your arm raised out sideways, like you're an airplane, so that's um, bringing it closer towards your um, hips, then that's known as adduction. So you're bringing it towards the midline, and then abduction is the reverse of that, sort of moving away from the, adline, uh, from the midline. So you're extending your arms outwards to become the airplane. Circumduction is the circular movement of a limb, so it might be uh, your arm, like you're bowling and over in cricket, for example, or we know that our thumbs can also undergo circumduction, um, so they can cause that rotation, but not all, um, many of our other joints are able to do that. And then rotation involves the twisting of a bone around its long axis. So if you sort of fix your um, humerus, your arm, next to your side, and then if you rotate your um, forearm, like you're sort of pointing out sideways, but having it fixed, that's rotation. So that's rotating your arm um, laterally and then bringing it back to the middle as medial rotation. So we can actually classify muscles based upon the arrangement of their fascicles within that muscle. Um, so there's four main classifications. Um, one of these, or the first of these, are parallel muscles, and biceps brachii is the classic example of these. Uh, sartorius is another um, example. So in a parallel muscle, like its name suggests, all of the fascicles run parallel to the long axis of the muscle. So these little lines here, these represent the uh, fascicles within that muscle. So you can see them represented here. And remembering they're surrounded by perimysium and the whole thing surrounded by epimysium. Um, so the fascicles run parallel to the long axis of the, the muscle and these are long cells. So in this case, all fascicles work together because they're all performing the same function. And in parallel muscles, the muscles can shorten by up to 70%. So we know biceps, for example, you flex your arm and if you've got well-developed biceps, you get this quite a large curl, don't you? Like this quite a large um, uh, upwards projection as the, the biceps um, shortens. Um, and you're showing off that muscle, for example. 
In a convergent muscle, so for example pectoralis major, all of the fascicles begin quite broadly, but then they all converge to a common attachment point. So this would be along the sternum, for example, and then this would insert um, into the humerus, on the side of the humerus there. So different fascicles may work independently, providing variation in the, the direction of contraction. So for example, only the upper fascicles might contract, but not necessarily the lower um, fascicles, and can that can bring about variation in control of those muscle contractions and those movements. The third type of classification of muscles based upon the fascicle arrangement is known as pennate muscles. Pennate means feather, so they look a little bit like feathers. Uh, so fascicles are, are attached at an angle to the tendon. So you can see the muscles all sort of attaching at different levels of this tendon. So more muscles, uh, fibers are actually uh, found per fascicle than in the parallel muscle. Now because you've got more muscle fibers per fascicle in a pennate muscle, you, these muscles can generally generate more force than a parallel muscle. And then we have a subclassification of these pennate muscles depending upon the one arrangement or a single uh, arrangement of the fascicles uh, in a unipennate, or if we've got two arrangements, we've got a bipennate muscle, or if we have like the deltoid muscle, for example, we've got three arrangements here, um, and this forms what's known as a multipennate muscle. So in this case, these different um, uh, fascicles can actually contract differently. So, for example, the different parts of the deltoid muscle can contract differently, bringing about slight variations in those actions that are brought about by those muscles. And so they all converge and then fuse uh, into one tendon here. So you can actually see the tendons eventually fusing down here. Um, so uh, an example of the unipennate muscle is the extensor digitorum muscle. This is a muscle in the forearm showing that here extensor digitorum means extensor of the digits so it enables you to extend your fingers up and out so sort of splaying you know bringing your fingers up towards um, your forearm um, rectus femoris muscle in the uh, quads here in the front of the quadriceps muscles is an example of a bipennate muscle and the deltoid muscle which is up in the shoulder here this is an example of the multipennate muscle now the fourth classification based upon the arrangement of the fascicles are the circular or the sphincter muscles. So for example, the uh, orbicularis oris or the orbicularis oculi, these are examples of these sphincter muscles. Uh, orbicularis oris is the one around the mouth, the oculi is the one around the eye. So when they contract, that enables you to squint or you know, enables you to uh, take your selfies uh, with your orbicularis oris give the duck face for your selfies and that's brought about by orbicularis oris. So the fascicles are concentrically arranged to encircle the tube or an opening, for example the mouth or the eye. You can imagine that quite, quite easily I think. So here we've got um, different muscle groups and this is um, for example the upper limb. Now you'll um, need to know a lot of these muscles um, during your time in our unit. Um, there's a whole two practicals related to the anatomy of the muscular system and the skeletal system uh, coming up. One's an online practical and then we'll do an anatomical body painting practical and a uh, identification of, of muscles on, on models practical. So um, in different regions we find the different um, functional groups of muscles. So for example in the anterior compartment of the arm uh, we've got the elbow flexors, so we've got our biceps brachii, uh, uh, brachioradialis, uh, brachialis and then the brachioradialis muscle here. So these bring about flexion of the elbow. Uh, on the posterior surface we have the compartment consisting of our elbow extensors. So we've got our triceps brachii. So in the anterior compartment of the forearm we've got our wrist flexors. So we've got uh, flexor carpi radialis which means flexor of the wrist on the radial side. Uh, the radial side is on the thumb side. Uh, palmaris longus. Not everyone actually has a palmaris longus. Um, so a good way to test if you actually have a palmaris longus is to uh, hold your palm. So have your palm facing outwards um, and then um, put your other hand on your fingers 
and then try to contract your hand so you're pointing your hand back towards your face but prevent it and if you can see a, a tendon right in the middle really projecting out at the wrist then that's your palmaris longus but not everyone has a palmaris longus um, so um, it's a unique variation in anatomy that we see in human anatomy and then flexor carpi ulnaris so flexor of the wrist carpi means wrist uh, ulnaris is on the ulna side um, so um, we've got the wrist flexors. Now on the posterior compartment of the uh, forearm, we've got the extensors. So that causes con contraction and that causes your wrist to bend backwards. So we've got extensor carpi ulnaris, so just like with the flexors, extensor of the wrist on the ulna side, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor of the wrist on the radial side, the long muscle, and then we've actually got a short muscle, extensor of the wrist of the radial side and a short muscle. Brevis means short, longus means long. So this is the wrist extensors on the posterior surface of the forearm. Okay, so that pretty much completes part two. Um, so please now complete the part two quiz for pre-class four to test your understanding of this content. When you're done, please progress to part three where we'll look at the connection between muscle cells, fascicles, muscle as a whole, and their connection to the skeletal system.